thank you so much for joining us tonight and for taking time out of your busy weeks to celebrate Founders Day, Wabash's 191st birthday with us tonight. Um, my name is Emily Vetney. I work here in Advancement, which includes fundraising and the Alumni and Affinity Groups Office. Um, and with us, our special guest tonight is Nolan Eller, class of 2011 here at Wabash College. He is our beloved archivist. Um, he's been back at Wabash since uh, September of 2021, but before that um, was all over Indiana. His history degree is from here, his bachelor's, and then he received his master's of library science down at IU Bloomington in 2013 and worked all over the state of Indiana and even down in a few different locations in Louisiana. And we are so lucky to have had Nolan back here for the past couple of years and hopefully for a long time forward. So thank you again for joining us and Nolan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emily, and uh, it's great to see some familiar faces, um, especially some former classmates. I'm seeing some other former class of 11s in, in the group, so that's awesome, and 12s, but is, so that's fantastic. Um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Nolan Eller, and I am the archivist at Wabash College, um, class of 2011. Um, started at the college uh, in, in the archives in 2021 as the digital archivist, and then was elevated to the role of college archivist in, 20, in the summer of 2022 with the uh, retirement of the beloved and Wabash legend Beth Swift, um, who was a uh, giant shoulders to stand upon and, and one of my uh, mentors and um, a great friend in, in addition to that. Um, so it's been an honor to be able to serve the college in this role. Um, as a student, I, I never imagined that I would be back at Wabash serving as the college archivist, um, but it's been a, a wild ride and it's it's just beginning. So hopefully it's a, it's a, it's a long journey um, and it's been a fun one thus far. Um, so in honor of Founders Day, um, I kind of did some digging through the college archives to see what I could find um, in relation to the history and, and the founding of the college um, and try to approach it from a little bit of a different angle um, as opposed to the stories that we've all heard um, in the past. So we've all heard about the founding of Wabash College um, from its very beginnings. And, and these are from the annals of Caleb Mills, or excuse me, of uh, Edmund Otis Hovey, 1832. So on November 21st, there was the first meeting of the board with a donation of 15 acres of land offered upon the condition of the purchase of a certain amount, about 20 acres adjoining at $20 an acre. On November 22nd, a meeting of the citizens of Crawfordsville at which the subject was more publicly discussed and a subscription was commenced towards the erection of a building on the site given by Williamson Dunn Esquire. Um, this site consisted of 15 acres of land upon the bluff or upland about half a mile west of Crawfordsville. At the close of deliberations of the brethren consisting of the constituting the original meeting, they went upon the grounds and selected the spot upon which to erect the first building. And there in solemn prayer in the midst of nature's unbroken loveliness, dedicated the enterprise to God and invoked his blessings upon it. That is kind of what we all hear about the founding. Um, and the story is continuing it's on, and it's actually kind of becoming almost a myth as opposed to the reality of what actually occurred. One of the most prolific um, and instrumental individuals of this founding is Edmund Otis, Otis Hovey, um, who was born in, on July 15th, 1801 in Hanover, New Hampshire, graduated from Dartmouth College in 1828 with uh, Caleb Mills, and in 1831, graduated from Andover Seminary, was ordained as a minister on September 21st, married Mary Carter on October 5th, and began travel to Wabash country, all in a very short time span. Um, he came to Wabash, or to the, to the Indiana Territory in the Wabash country through the American Homes um, um, Mission Society, um, with a mission to wanting to establish uh, established churches 
and educate the um, the Wild West. Um, in January of 1832, he arrived at his congregation in Coal Creek, which is in Fountain County. Um, and then, as we all know, in, um, in November, he was called upon by James Thompson to assist in the establishing of Wabash, the Wabash Teachers Seminary and Manual Labor College. After that, he served the college from 1834 to 1877, serving in various roles throughout the history. So he was, uh, as mentioned, trustee. He's one of our first librarians of the college, college treasurer, faculty secretary, and one of our first faculty me members, including the first Rose Professor of Chemistry and Geology from 1855 to 1877. Um, he passed away. Um, on March 10th, 1877, here in Crawfordsville. The Edmund O. Hovey letter collection um, basically documents almost the entirety of Edmund Hovey's life um, from 1822 to 1876. There are nearly 400 letters um, documenting the life of Edmund Hovey and his wife, Mary Carter Hovey. Um, and the biggest thing that these letters provide us is they provide the accounts of the events in the early history of Wabash College, pioneer life in frontier Indiana, Presbyterian thought and missionary activity, and the Hovey family history. All of the material that I'm talking about today um, is available. It's all been digitized um, with transcripts for the majority of the collection, um, and it's all available through the um, Ramsey College Archives um, website. And so you have access to it whenever, wherever you would like it. Um, and in addition to that, we have um, Edmund Otis, Otis Hovey's scrapbook as well has been digitized and is available for you to utilize um, and perform your research in addition to seeing the physical materials here at the Ramsey Archival Center. So to begin with, um, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of walk you through some of these letters, um, kind of tracing Edmund Hubby's road to Wabash, um, and, and, and also kind of tracing the period from around 1831 up to about 1840. Those are kind of the seminal periods in Wabash history. Um, so this is one of Edmund of Otis Hubby's early letters after he, um, he, um, was questioning what he was going to be doing with his life. Um, and I've highlighted one section of this little portion of this letter, um, but my mind is somewhat turned towards the destitute portions of the United States. Should I go to the West? Um, and that was really the, the, the groundbreaking, the seminal um, message that Hubby eventually would decide, decide upon. Um, and he would travel West. Um, shortly after Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Hovey and Mary, um, her correspondence really document that travel incredibly well. Um, so um, in her letters, um, they are very candid. Here she's writing to her sister Emily Carter um, from October 26, 1831. Um, but in the morning, it was so windy the boat could not go out, and found myself threatening threatened pretty violently with a fever, swing to a bad cold I had taken and I and the fatigue of my journey. I struggled hard to throw off my fever and make myself well, but in vain. About noon, Mr. Hubby called Dr. Sprague in and who gave me some medicine and told me to go to bed and lie till I got better. My fever very soon subsided and I am now quite well. He has been in since I commenced writing and says he thinks it will be perfectly safe for me to take the morning boat. Um, this is, they were actually, this was written in Niagara. So they were up in Northern New York, beginning their travel west. Um, the family have been, the, the family they've been staying with had been very attentive and the chambermaid has taken good care of me and my room. But I have found that a husband was a very attentive manner. I ate water gruel yesterday and a day before, um, but today I have eaten toast crackers, codfish, fowl, etc. Now, dear mother and sister, I have written exactly how I am and have been so that you need not trouble your imagination by picturing my case any worse than it is. I love that little ending line because it's kind of the, 
very what we what we would say today to our parents it's okay don't worry about us here's what it here's what's going on um but this all this letter also kind of gives us an idea of of how sickness was treated um and how these travels these these travels west were incredibly burdensome on the individuals taking these these missions um and can show a larger picture of what what was going on in um, 19th century America. Another letter from Mary to Emily um, on October 26, 1831. Um, we, we find that Fort Wayne is not to be our home, but probably Lafayette, about 100 miles further west. I know nothing about the place, but hope to be there before I write you again. We cannot make any calculations about the remainder of our journey, but design taking it as it comes. Dear sister, I ought not write any more tonight, but I cannot help writing. My heart is so full. Um, this is where they were actually kind of coming into Detroit. Um, so um, they were, again, making their journey west. And you'll see a description of how um, Mary kind of describes Detroit to her sister. Yesterday, I walked all about the city and found it not much like our Northeastern cities. A great many of the houses are only one story. The appearance of the inhabitants reminds me very much of the Marietta people, which I've done some research. I have not been able to pinpoint who the Marietta people are yet, um, but that leads to some questions of, um, further research that these letters uh, contain that can be potentially um, looked at by researchers like yourselves or researchers from outside the institution. Um, because not only do these, these documents, uh, again, document the history of Wabash College, but they document the history of the United States, uh, more generally speaking. Finally, Mary and, um, oh, and Edmund make it to Indiana. Um, and there are some descriptions. Mary, in this letter, she describes in great detail, which is why I did not include it, every nook and cranny of the cabin for which they were staying. Um, but I did pull out um, the quote, the, the top quote, almost any time during the day we can hear the melancholy song of the turtle dove, the shrill notes of the whip, whip who will, whip a will, the meadow lark who lends her voice in company with many others, we have the turkey buzzard, wild turkeys, wild geese, prairie hens, also the prairie of barking wolf, and occasionally a rattlesnake or a variety of a black racer. Um, again, just documenting what life was like in Pioneer, Indiana, um, to her family who had most likely never seen these, uh, these types of uh, scenery uh, before. And she'd never, most likely, never seen these this scenery before. Um, it's just an ecological treasure trove. Um, and then um, she did leave a little bit of uh, space for her husband to write. Um, Mary has given you quite a pathetic description of her house and furniture, et cetera, which she did. It was very sparse and barren. Um, she accuses me of a breach of promise and only one thing. Um, she says, I promised her a log cabin with one glass window and two paper ones, but we'll leave it to mother if I have not done about as well since the window we have is a glass window of twice the common size. Um, another thing that I love about this letter is looking at the actual letter itself and seeing how almost every space of that letter uh, is taken up with writing and it demonstrates really the scarcity of paper um, of this during this period. Um, you had to use every inch of material that you had to convey a message. Um, while it does make it a little complicated to read um, at times, you're, it's it's kind of like uh, deciphering a puzzle. Uh, but I think that I I just love the way that the actual letter itself is composed, and you can see the different directions that the, the the, the writing is in throughout the letter. You'll see where it's overwritten. Um, so it's just really kind of a treasure trove within itself. Finally, we get to um, Williamson Dunn, um, who was one of the uh, founders, who, who donated the land to the college and was one of our first trustees, 
also helped to establish um, Hanover College um, and is buried in Bloomington. Um, Williamson Dunn to James Thompson, um, November 12th, 1832. So just before Wabash College was formed, the cholera raged in Madison for days Fearfully, about 20 of the citizens dead with, with, with it. There have there has been two or three new cases for two weeks past, and there are will likely and they will likely increase. We have had one or probably two cases in our village, but no death. We fondly hope that it has that it has lapsed over and that it has left us. Yellow fever is terrible in the low country. Um so again, you have a letter by one of our founders to one of our other founders, James Thompson, not necessarily specifically about Wabash College, but more about what was going on in these settlements in um, the frontiers of what would become uh, established and in, in, in settled Indiana territory. Um, you'll also see that bottom quote, I have consulted with William McKee on the subject of taking charge of your academy. He consents to your proposition, provided 12 or 15 students can be had. So we all hear about Caleb Mills being the first faculty member, um, but he was not the first faculty member to be considered by the founders of the college. Um, and you'll see William McKee is one of those individuals. So now you're getting right back to um, the founding of the college. And this letter here um, was from James Thompson to Williamson Dunn, November 22nd, 1832. In this letter, he details the meeting of December 21st and the 22nd um, to, to Williamson Dunn. Um, and he also mentions, I spoke, I also spoke of the other arrangement with reference to Mr. McKee. The brethren th thought that they, that there would, could probably be nothing done on that subject this winter. Um, they were not prepared to start making those arrangements until the college was in better, um, had better footing. Um, and there were more established, um, they were the, the college as an institution was more established before making those calls to individuals to run the school. Um, from James Thompson to Williamson Dunn, eight, er, December 12th, 1832. Um, I have arrived in a town and put up here since dark on my way home. Accidentally, I heard that you were here and came to your room expecting to see you. Uh, but you are out, and as I expected to leave at daylight or before it, I shall not see you. I hope you will endeavor to be with us next week at our meeting of the trustees at Crawfordsville, as it will probably be an interesting meeting for us. I hope you will succeed in your enterprise um, in obtaining a college charter for the institution. So now we're kind of moving. The college has been founded. The institution has um, been dedicated now we are working towards getting our charter um, and the, the the actual process of obtaining the charter was a hard task uh, a hard task to, to hoe um, and a lot of that fell on Williamson Dunn and his influence with the state house in Indianapolis um, at the same time though um, and this is not related to this letter um, you with with hubby um, he himself was actually considering taking up another position um, in Lafayette um, with another with the with the Presbyterian Church in Lafayette, and he had actually been writing to James Thompson about what does what he should do in relation to that decision. Um, so you you've got a lot of balls at play um, with the early uh, start of the college. Um, James was. Uh, um, his advice to, to Hovey was to that he would prefer that Hovey stick with his current congregation in Coal Creek and eventually uh, join further with the with Wabash College. Um, here's a letter from James Thompson to Williamson Dunn on March 13th, 1833. So we have we moved to 1833. Um, we have some expectation of getting George Bishop, the doctor's son for the teacher, provided he should be chosen by the trustees 
when they meet. He is now on nomination, so is Mr. Lewis of Rising Sun. So again, you have the founders of the college, the trustees of the college, going through all of the motions to ensure that the college is going to be successful. You're also going to see here in this letter that they've started to um, construct buildings um, and or construct a building um, for the first um, for the first building of the college. Um, and, and they're really starting to get on their way. Um, but you'll also see that Caleb Mills is not necessarily being considered at this point in the history of the college. Until now. So Caleb Mills to James Thompson, September 19th, 1833. Um, so this was after he was offered the position um, with, and um, Otis uh, Edmund Hovey was very instrumental in achieving that for Caleb Mills. They were friends from Dartmouth. They were acquaintances. Um, and Hubby knew and advocated very heavily for Caleb Mills with the trustees. Um, you'll see here he's meant he's talking about um, his travels to Crawfordsville. Um, and, and so he's going to be actually going through Cincinnati um, and Madison and staying for a little bit. Um, I, I like the fact that the books and the apparatus for the school, I hope, will reach Crawfordsville in safety. Um, and then you'll also see kind of the, the, the hazards of doing transcription. You'll see the, the question mark, um, cause these are in their hand. These are the, their writings, their personal letters. Um, sometimes we just can't decipher what, what they have written. Um, because some of this is, is written during their travels. We, and some of this is just kind of, some of them just had bad handwriting, <laughs> to be completely perfectly honest. Um, but uh, you will see that, that that the college is kind of starting to find its footing a little bit. And Caleb Mills kind of accepting the, the call to come to Wabash and, and be its first principal and instructor. Um, we're kind of on our way. Um, to the up uh, to a an established institution. Um, and then then now you're going to get back to James Thompson to Edmund of Otis Hovey, um, February 24th, 1834. So this is when Wabash College finally was being considered for its charter. Um, and you'll hear and you, you can read some of the um, stipulations. So the stipulation that we had to be non-denominational in terms of our original um, or within the charter. But after the clause allowing absent members to vote by proxy was introduced, I, I considered it best that we should accept and run all the risk connected with a, it rather than reject it. Still, as you say, I would rather that that feature did not exist. So it wasn't the solution that they were looking for with the charter, but it was the, the um, solution that was going to get the institution off the ground and chartered. It was very important to have a charter, not only for the legitimacy of the institution, but to raise funds, which is something you'll see a little bit later on in the presentation. So um, Edmund Ovis Hovey um, to James Thompson. So this letter is pretty interesting um, because this letter from June 12th, 1834 was never sent. So at this time, Edmund Ovis Hovey um, was out East. He was um, fundraising for the college, um, trying to find funds for the college this period in the United States history. We were kind of approaching the panic of 1837. Um, so funds were not um, all around to be had. Um, and you can, by read and just reading that, you really read the discouragement that Hubby is feeling as he's fundraising for the college um, and the struggles that he's having fundraising for the college. Um, I will tell you what I am strongly inclined to do is as soon as I can earn enough, earn money enough to carry me back to Crawfordsville to return and advise the trustees to suspend operations in relation to the college till a change of times take place. And in the meantime, 
do all we can to procure the proper man for the president and to awaken interest in the public mind if such a man can be found. So we didn't have a president at this point. Um, and again, that was one of the biggest hindrances to allowing the college to raise funds. And a lot of our founders in those early days spent a lot of their time on the East Coast in major city in New York, in Boston, um, in the Northeast, raising money because that was where a lot of the money and our and our early uh, supporters were found. Um, James Thompson to Edmund Hovey, December second, eighteen thirty four. Um, so he uh, is kind of giving a snapshot of what was occurring at the college um, during these these very early years. It was a new thing here, and the boys actually did well. So it, it produced a very favorable impression in our favor on the community at large. This session commenced with about 40 students, and at present they number on their roll 50 or 51. The number will probably amount to 60 during the winter. The Brethren Mills and Thompson are put up to all they know to lead the way, but as far as I can learn, they stand high as teachers, both among the students and the citizens generally. Last fall's examinations and the ex exhibition did them much credit in the estimation of the citizens. Several of the men who are who a year ago cursed the institution in their hearts and would have put it down if it had been their power are now sending their sons to it. Everything appears to favor us. Um, so again, you're kind of seeing all efforts for Wabash um, in the college in these early years, because not only did they have to um, become chartered, start to build an in, actual infrastructure, they had to win over the citizens of Indiana and to get students um, and also the citizens of Crawfordsville um, to kind of, uh, and they, they had to work really hard to do that. Um, and you can really see where there's optimism here from James Thompson to, to Edmund Hubby. Um, and, and you're seeing somewhat of a tide turning um, in Wabash's favor uh, in relation to um, the growth of the college. Just might I add also two years after we're founded or roughly two years after we um, after uh, the meeting was had to actually establish an institution. So we're moving pretty quickly, um, especially um, for 19th century America, as we're kind of starting to develop ourselves as a small as, as an institution of learning and education. So finally, um, Wabash College uh, selects its first president. So Elihu W. Baldwin to Edmund O. Hovey, January 9th, 1835. Um, in this letter, uh, um, President Baldwin basically tells Hovey um, that he has been offered the position of Wabash College president. He accordingly uh, desire me to consider the question of my election virtually settled and wishes no time to be lost in waiting for a more formal appointment, which, however, he says will be forthcoming. He adds that affairs that there are in a very prosperous train, they will need a new building very soon, and he suspects that means he can obtain, or it can be obtained to erect it. Um, so again, the college is growing. We need uh, further lodging and, and resources for our students, um, and having a president um, is going to be a key, um, and, and kind of speaking back to what Edmund Hubby was saying in his earlier letter about how, uh, about the, the, the troubles of establishing and, and raising funds was, and one of those issues was we didn't have a president. Now we did have a president. Um, president, or president Baldwin was an established minister in the Northeast. Um, so he kind of came to the college with individuals with backers in mind, um, and was really one of those first instrumental individuals along with Edmund Hovey and Caleb Mills to get the ball rolling on, on the college and the institution itself um, as we can, again, continue to grow. Um, here, you're going to see uh, a circular that was circulated um, by both Hovey 
and President Baldwin um, in New York. Eight, and from this is from February 12, 1835. Um, they were wanting to raise $40,000, um, which was not a small task in 1835. That's roughly $1.3 million today. Um, and this circular basically says, gives a background of the institution um, and provides reassurances to those who are, are potentially going to be uh, donated funds to the college um, to um, allow them some assurances, um, especially as, and, and you will see it again as we kind of are getting into a kind of a rough period uh, in uh, America and the history of the United States um, with the Panic of 1837. And just uh, as I was mentioning, so here's Elihu Baldwin's letter to Edmund Hovey. Um, my intention is to visit all of our patrons and give them an opportunity of doing what they can to aid us in the present emergency. The result cannot be foretold. I have already done better than some predicted and I have prospects ahead. I shall try for loans, but I cannot say I am that I am sanguine of that success. People had rather have their money in hand ready for some speculation or secured as a good interest under their eyes than loaned out on any terms in Indiana. It is painful to think of the wreck which has been made of the hard earned fortunes in this city. So not only, again, are you seeing Wabash history, you're seeing the connection to the history of the United States. Um, the Panic of 1837 was a huge event um, that sucked up um, the fortunes of many people throughout the country. Um, with the collapse of the banking systems. Um, and that has a huge impact on Wabash College and 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 the individuals and and Wabash attaining the funds that it needs to function as an institution. And here is another, and this is from 1930 or 1838, October 2nd, 1838, from Eli, Dr. Baldwin to add to the troubles of fundraising. Um, this was the letter that pr Professor or President Baldwin sent to uh, Professor Hovey when he heard about the uh, fire at Wabash College, which burned down the majority of our structures. Um, again, adding to the hard road that had to be towed to get Wabash College off the ground. I cannot well describe to you my emotions. The, the chastisement is heavy indeed. I, however, rejoice to hear that none of the students perished in the conflagration and in knowing that the providence of God has ordered all it, it is best that we should succeed in our enterprise. There are resources left in his world and in his hands. Um, so Wabash at this period, um, the college as a whole, was kind of in a rough spot. Um, we'd lost all pretty much all of our structures. We were having difficulties raising funds um, because of the panic of 37. Um, we had a little bit of a handout from the city, the Crawford city of Crawfordsville with some of their donations to the college to help rebuild. Um, and luckily we, we, we survived and we were able to make it through. Um, after that, um, and this is kind of where the story for, for the majority of the founding of the college kind of ends uh, for this presentation. Um, it's from Edmund Hovey um, to Israel Dewey, October 16th, 1840. It is with great, with, it is with deep gr grief that I take my pen to inform you of the death of our excellent president, Reverend Elihu W. Baldwin. He departed his life on the 15th after illness of more than four weeks. His disease was fever, prob probably typhus. His death seems to us short-sighted as we are a calamity. Dr. Baldwin was a, more, a most admirable and lovely man, a uniformly devoted and faithful Christian, and a successful and able minister of the gospel, and in all respects, just such a man as we needed at the head of our college. Um, so with the death of Dr. or President Baldwin, um, 
you have a little bit of a paradigm shift in the history of Wabash College. Um, and really in, in um, the life of Edmund Hubby, uh, because after uh, President Baldwin's passing, um, we have this, our second president is selected, um, Charles White, who, in addition to being a um, an excellent president for the time, was also Edmund Hubby's brother-in-law. So the connections between Hovey and really those founding members of the college itself um, are incredibly clear. Um, and as one of the original founders, um, his influence is one that is still felt to this day. Um, one thing that I find kind of interesting um, in, in a letter that he wrote on um, later on in his life he mentioned that one of his main regrets uh, was that he have that I have not been a better man and done more good. Um, I think that he was a little short-sighted in that statement because he did do a lot of good um, with the establishment of the college, with the students that he helped to um, mentor and grow, um, and the life that he lived here in Indiana as, as the college as itself began to develop and grow. And he's an individual who uh, we can look up to as, as, again, as one of our founders who had the largest, who had one of the largest impacts on the college and one of the more lasting impacts on the college, not only for his own works, but for the individuals he brought to camp and who he brought to Wabash and the connections that he used to bring to Wabash. Um, but the, the students that he helped to tutor and uh, educate um, that later went on to larger careers throughout the United States um, and really the world. Um, he's one of my, he's an individual that I feel doesn't get a lot of uh, credit in, in the discussions of, of the founding of the college and, and the students today don't really know that much about Edmund Hovey apart from the Hovey, Hovey Cottage um, which is the communications building here on campus, which was his home while here at Wabash. Um, but his story and the story through his letters um, is one that's fascinating and interesting and tells not only a story of um, the founding of a college, but tells the story of um, 19th century America and the trials and tribulations of Western um exploration and Western travel. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you for ha letting me speak tonight. I know I'm, I'm ending a little earlier, but that gives us more times for questions. Um, and I look forward to hearing from um, all of you who are here in the room um, and, and learning from you. That's one of my, um, my joys of being archivist. Um, if you should have any questions or would like to utilize any of the resources at the Ramsey Archives, please feel free to reach out to myself. Um, my email address is there or our new digital archivist, Evan Miller. Um, and we can answer uh, any questions that you have. Um, I'd also advertise that if you don't follow us on Instagram, I, I'd suggest following us on Instagram. We typically post um, every week. Um, and uh, again, this has been a joy. And I'm actually, I'll show you really quickly since I've got a little bit extra time. Um, so we have had some new additions to our website. And if you'd like to see any of the materials that I've talked about tonight, they are located in our digital collections page on our website. And those letters are right here, the Edmund Hubby letters. And you are able to search them and go through them through their entirety. Um, it's a fantastic resource in addition to some of our other collections um, that have been digitized more recently. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a great, uh, great resource for Wabash College history. Um, so thank you again. And I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Nolan, so much. We've got a few questions in the chat and then we can sort of, I'll change the view here so we can see each other and we can open it up for questions. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. so Key Kim um, wonders uh, how the school operated from 1832 to 1834. Was it pretty unstable? How could we recruit students without being chartered and without having a president? 
<laughs> so thank you, Key. Um, it was uh, up and down during those periods. Um, and we were kind of, at that time, we were kind of meeting the need of the local individuals um, who were um, needing, needing, meeting the needs of the students here in the, the local area. Um, you were also looking at students of uh, some of the founders and their work um, to bring in students to the college. Um, we were, and, and, and at that time, Caleb Mills. So Caleb Mills was brought in as the first principal of the school. We weren't necessarily a college at that time. So we were kind of, a, it was a manual and labor school to begin with. Um, and actually kind of operated a little bit like a high school. Um, and, 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 um, and so we were, we were able to bring in students to the school. Um, and it's an area that um, I'm still learning about. And that's one, that's one area where I, it's, that's one of the joys of the position and the job. I get to learn new things every day. And I know because Key um, is one of our uh, former interns in the archives, and he did a lot of the uh, digitization work on the Wabash and the Black Community Oral History Project. Um, and so his work is very well um, documented here in the archives as well. And so that's, he's, he's, he is, is one example of uh, current students utilizing the resources of, of the, the, the archives and, and furthering the story of Wabash College. Hope that answered a part of your question, Key. Um, another question, where exactly was the original campus? Was it by the Yountsville Bridge or somewhere else? So the original campus is just a little bit farther north from where we currently sit. There actually is a marker, um, and I wish I could, I, I'm not going to pull it up on the map, but there is, it's, it's just a few blocks north of where we currently are. Um, and the marker, it's unfortunate, the, uh, it's kind of, um, it's just on a corner. It, there's not a lot of appreciation set, uh, to this marker, and it's an, actually in the corner of an individual's house. Um, so um, it's, but again, it's just a few blocks north kind of closer to Sugar Creek overlooking the bluff. All right. Um, Nolan, do you have any idea, is it true that Caleb Mills and um, Edmund Hovey were Dartmouth roommates? It, um, I don't know that for, sh for a fact. That's something that would not shock me if they were or were not. Again, that's kind of an area where I'm still learning more. Um, but it would not shock me to if that were the case. Roland, do you want to jump on? I see that you're the one who posted. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I saw that on Wikipedia when I looked it up earlier tonight. So very cool. <laughs> very and cool. Ma maybe you can tell me. I was curious, who is Horace Hovey? Is he Horace a... is is Edmund's son. Because he's pretty famous for being the first person to do a lot of mapping of Mammoth Cave, right? Yes, that's correct. So Horace um, did a lot of the mapping for Mammoth. He he was a spelunker, actually one of the first spelunkers in and to uh, documented spelunkers in the United States history. Um, and then Edmund Hovey's grandson, Edmund Otis Hovey, was also a faculty member. I forget what I believe he was at Yale. Yes. Um, yeah. um, so that's the yeah the the Hovey uh, family is is well documented in, in terms of education. And Mary Hovey, um, his daughter, was one of the first female faculty members at um, what would become Kansas State University in Manhattan. So, and then she came back to Wabash um, or Crawfordsville and actually operated a, a small school out of, out of the Hubby Cottage while she was living here. So education um, uh, ran, ran, uh, ran well through the Hubby household. Um, and, and while students, it's uh, one of the fascinating stories that I've, um, and doing some of the research for this project and also just researching the college in general, it's fascinating to hear the stories of the students using um, Hubby Cottage and the Hubby's kind of um, um, housing students uh, when they were here at the college um, and that the band kept their instruments in the attic of Hubby Cottage. So, and so it's just, it's a fascinating melting pot um, of uh, different cultures, different uh, 
different communities and just hearing how the faculty and the students commune together very much during those early years um, and continue to do so today. All right, um, Dr. Roberts asks, do you have a history of how Montgomery County uh, ended up giving money to Wabash after the fire um, to rebuild, which resulted in the Montgomery County Commissioner Scholarship, which pays for a student every two years? So, um, I, uh, that, uh, that, so I've been told that there were funds set aside um, for the creation of a women's college in Crawfordsville. And when the Wabash College, um, when the fire occurred, um, the college uh, or the city of Crawfordsville uh, diverted those funds to the college for the, to help rebuild the college. Um, that's kind of what I've been told thus far and, and what I've seen in the research. But again, that's um, more reading to do thus far and more discovering and more digging to find those hidden stories. I'm really torn, Nolan, because on one hand, I'm happy that Wabash exists, but I would have liked a woman's college, too, I think. Um, all right, Mr. Pactor, hey, friend, how are you? Um, wants to know who saved these letters and how did the college get them? That is a little murky. Um, so these letters were actually... Um, acquired during the um, after were actually cataloged um, by um, one of our first archivists, um, President Hopkins' wife. Um, so after President Hopkins passed away, um, the college was looking for something for um, Mrs. Hopkins to uh, a project for Mrs. Hopkins to do to help uh, um, provide funding for her and her family. Um, and President Sparks um, uh, uh, decided that she should assist with the Wabash History Room, which was a room that was held in Yandy's library. Um, and it was kind of an amalgamation of the Hovey Museum. So Hovey was a, a big collector. Um, and I'm sure everybody on this call has heard of the Hovey Museum. Um, and it was during, and then also just the documents of the early establishment of the college, including these letters. There are, uh, and so she cataloged and documented all of these letters. There is another collection of hubby letters that's held by the Indiana State Library. And, and there's also a set of um, Caleb Mills letters that are held by the Indiana Historical Association. Um, so the letters are around and they're, um, and, and we have them now, or we have at least a chunk of them and, and they're being preserved and, and being able to, uh, be accessed by anybody and everybody throughout the United States. I know that didn't really answer your question, John, to the, the fullest extent, but I hope it answered it enough to provide some further context to, to the, to the hubby letters. And if you feel, you feel free to jump in if you'd like. Well, I'll jump in. I think it's amazing that they were saved. Uh, like lots of things in history, it's, you never know when something's important. So saving things is important. It's a conversation you and I have had. Absolutely. Times, but this is a good example of it. Yeah, they, they tell an incredible story of, of the history of the college and really document the, the history of the college um, incredibly well. So yeah, they're a real treasure trove um, in addition to um, Edmund Hovey's scrapbook, um, which is also another really fantastic document um, that we have here in the archives and that has also been digitized and is available electronically. A kind of a fun question going back to the um, general history of Indiana during the 19th century. Do the letters that you've read tell us anything about Crawfordsville's environment during the time of the founding. Um, this commenter adds um, that uh, prairie chickens, which don't exist in Indiana anymore, used to like open habitats. So do you do you know, have you learned about what Indiana's nature and environment was like from these letters? Apart from everything that um, Mary has told us, I, that's kind of the, the extent of what I've learned thus far. Um, Crawfordsville at the time, uh, we weren't the, un I mean, we were a pretty well-developed area or we weren't well-developed, but we were developing. 
Um, Crawfordsville uh, as, a, as a settlement had been already established before Wabash College came to this area. So, um, and the wilderness around the college um, and the natural area around the college was a little bit more undefined. Um, but the about but the um, but the uh, but the air but the area itself um, was becoming more developed because Crawfordsville at this time was the land office for Western um, Indiana. So you had a lot of settlers coming through Crawfordsville to pr purchase and acquire land um, and property. Um, the letters themselves, um, from what I've learned thus far, uh, Indiana is is an, 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 an area. It was it was um, a, a, it was an area that was um, relatively un, unsettled to a point. Um, the flora and fauna that Mary kind of describes is pretty incredible and amazing. Um, she was an avid gardener, um, and so later on in her letters, she very much often talks about. Uh, the flowers that she plants around the hubby cottage, um, the flowers um, throughout her garden, um, and the plants that she was was growing. Um, but there's still more to learn, and that's again kind of the the treasures of these these letters and these and in, in the materials here at the, the archives is you can really dig in to find and answer the questions that you, that you would like to um, the unanswered questions and, and the queries that you have. Um, and really add further context to what um, the history of the college and the history of the state of Indiana um, really was like. Um, we talk a lot about the founders and their connections to Dartmouth, but Key would like to know um, a few of them had connections to Andover Seminary and uh, is interested in the connections between not just Dartmouth, but Andover um, and its influence on Wabash's founding. Yeah. So um, again, our early founders, a lot of our early founders were ministers. We have a big connection with Andover, Andover um, Seminary and also Lane Seminary. So early on in our, our um, history, a lot of our, we did have a, a students coming up through Lane Seminary. Um, it is an area that I'm still kind of exploring, um, but it's an area uh, that's kind of interesting to me. And also kind of seeing that um, the American Home Missionary Society, kind of their movements and their influence on the establishments of schools really throughout the Midwest. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a history that's, that's really fascinating. Um, I, I recently, and then I can't lay my hands on it now, I, I actually came across a map of the American Home um, Seminary, or the American Home Seminary, or the American Home Missionary Society, which kind of demonstrated all of the locations for where they were sending individuals out um, to establish, uh, or sending in, sending individuals out for churches, um, and and our founders were utilizing the the his, the, the, the the tool of education to um, further. Um, further their missionary and, and further their missions um, to educate um, the masses, um, not only uh, for the betterment of their, um, not only for just their overall education, but for their religious activities as well. I know that didn't really answer your question, Keith, but. All right, um, I don't have another question from a, an alumnus right now, so I'll ask a selfish one, Nolan, that I had um, uh, back at the beginning of your presentation. Um, I'm also an IU grad and um, was wondering, Williamson Dunn, is he of the Dunn Woods family? The Dunn? Okay, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, so there's a, because there's a seminary or a, a cemetery. In, yeah, in, the little one, the haunted one. The little yeah. one, yes. Yep. Fascinating. Is he in there? I believe he don't quote me on this i believe he is but i'm, I'm gonna have to check find a grave i have little <laughs> tingles man i didn't even know that wabash existed until two and a half years ago and i was walking past one of our founding guys <laughs> six years before that that's so sweet well it's um and it's kind of interesting because we will be celebrating our 200th anniversary in in uh 2032 um, and it's actually kind of fascinating because IU has just celebrated their 200th 
and Hanover will be next and Wabash will be third. So you can kind of trace that lineage of that migration uh, of the establishments of school, which schools, which is kind of really interesting and fascinating. All right, fellas, we technically have five more minutes. If anyone would like to jump in with a question or a comment, um, feel free to just unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, here's another one. Thanks, John. Um, do you know when Wabash ended its association with the Presbyterian Church? So um, early on in the history, um, we uh, there was Wabash actually had its own church. Um, it was called Center Presbyterian Church. It's actually where um, Pike Place currently stands. Uh, the last uh, uh, professor, or, or excuse me, president who was not a uh, ordained minister of the Presbyterian Church was um, Lewis Hopkins. So that's into the 19 or late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, that's really where the break kind of begins um, with the with the act with the church itself, um, or the loose affiliation with the church is with Hop Hopkins is really the the Hopkins as a president is really the president who really defined Wabash as it currently is. He was the one who instituted the oral comps um, and the written comps um, and really more modern curriculum um, for the education of students. <laughs> All right, well, there's a laugh emoji on this question, so I'm not sure if it'll get me in trouble um, to read aloud, but um, Michael wants to know why you didn't weave in the expulsion of Basil Barrickman. <laughs> Why don't you tell me a little bit more about the expulsion of of Basil Barrickson, Barrickman? Well, I'm I'm not really sure I can exactly. <laughs> sure you can. <laughs> I wasn't there. Is this of the Barrickman's revenge? I don't know yes, what that is, but I've heard is. that phrase. You're talking to the man associated with it. Yep. Joel Page and I uh, were the co-founders of Barrickman's Revenge, partly because I spent so much time in the Lilly Library um, as a student, and also I got to work with John Swan. I'm sure some of you remember, um, and I'm I'm a librarian now. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a recovering attorney, librarian. Um, <laughs> so yeah, sorry, that was just a. Sorry, end of the thing. <laughs> just thought I'd throw it in there. <laughs> well, and that's an area too. So we, you, you as alumni, do have access to the faculty minutes. Um, so if there's stuff that you want to look into, you can ask us those questions, and we can see what we can find for you. Well, no, truthfully, actually, I when I was working as uh, with with John Swan, I was I ended up in the archives one night. I. You know, I have this kind of vagus memory. You know how you get old, you have vague memories of finding this like rolled up little scroll thing that was like stuffed into one of those little because the archives at that time was up on the third floor. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I remember finding this thing and unrolling it and going like, oh, this is really interesting. Someone has someone was kicked out of Wabash like in 1834. <laughs> and it's like and the board of trustees or the board or however they were configured at the time made this was a letter to basil's mother hmm. right explaining why he was being you know the card playing the dancing it was all wrong right and so it was you it know, just my, seemed like a perfect for, kind of thing for the benefit of those who don't know you should probably briefly explain what barrickman's revenge was yes absolutely oh well it was um so there had been for a long time always a humor magazine at wabash right the caveman mm -hmm. um and so we were in a deficit in terms of, um, I don't know, satire. And of course this was, uh, so I was there from 1977 to 81. And it, this was a time when Saturday Night Live was coming out, you know, National Lampoon was happening. So the whole idea was that we would be clever about things and want, wanted to create a kind of a, a, a magazine for, for satire. It was really just self-promotion basically, but <laughs> um <laughs> so in fact i was showing uh i forget who um my my little uh thing in the where, where i replaced lou salter for a day um which some people remember and it was 
anyway, so I spent a lot of time at Wabash not learning anything <laughs> from the professors, but learning sort of large things about life. Um, anyway, sorry, it was an aside. <laughs> <laughs> and and let me add unsolicited, right? Barracks and Revenge, when it started, was funny. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you, John. I'm going to have to look through and see if I can read them. Well, it came to a tragic end, as I understand. Actually, I was, I forget when I went to Wabash and went to the archives. Um, it became, this is my view, Mean Girls and and sort of ended in a, mm. in a bad way uh, i know there's been then there was some resurgence of the humor magazine idea and i think the caveman came back is that right yes it did for a very short period of time joel were you associated with the caveman at all i was the last person to write the caveman there you go okay wow. yeah and so so is there any kind of is there anything in that um i guess milieu of magazine there's really not at wabash now right not there's the bachelor. Yeah. yeah yeah pretty much just the bachelor currently anyway thank you nolan you did a yes. fantastic job absolutely you, emily oh just a quick question emily who's your roommate <laughs> i was gonna ask that too but my, my the roommate? cat Oh, <laughs> I put in earbuds so you wouldn't hear. I remember, gosh, my first month at Wabash, I was on a call that happened to have a trustee on it and my boss, the Dean of Advancement, and she climbed up on my lap and unshared my PowerPoint and I wanted to die. So I put in the earbuds tonight thinking that you couldn't hear her. But yes, yeah, she's very, very loud. Her name is Frank Lloyd Wright, um, even though she's a girl. Um, big history fans around here. So um all right, just for our last alumni comment, John wants to offer Nolan kudos on being able to read those letters. Those were pretty gnarly, <laughs> some of them. So, all right, um, any final questions before we wrap up? We could probably take one more, but I do want to respect Nolan's time. He's got so much to go learn now. We have to learn yes. about the barking peafowl or whatever else. Lives. Yes, absolutely. Nolan, thank you very much. Extremely informative. Yeah, happy. I'm happy to do it. and. Like I said, any, and one of the joys of this is kind of meeting with all of the alums and learning more about Wabash history through you um, and and adding to the archives and the history of the college. So I'd love if you want to chat or talk, just shoot me an email and I'd love to kind of communicate with you and um, or if you have questions about Wabash history more generally. Um, it's it's an honor to serve the institution in this way, um, and it's it's fun to kind of be surrounded every day by different stories and different alums and and different aspects of Wabash history, but also meet uh, alums like yourselves um, and hear your stories and and what uh, what a Wabash education did for you um, and your careers after Wabash. So thank you. It was an honor. Well, thank you, Nolan, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and for celebrating Founders Day. Uh, our next um, After the Bell is going to be in January. We're taking a month off in December because everyone's gonna be busy with holidays and travel and myself and my colleagues are gonna hopefully take some time off. So our next event is January 18th with uh, retired English professor Warren Rosenberg. And he's going to be talking about films and masculinity and how a couple of different films shape his own personal Jewish American male identity. And he's going to ask you to come prepared to talk about certain films that might have affected your own self-perception, whether that be about your own gender or your own race or your job or, you know, your family life. Um, so that should be really good. Again, that's January 18th at the same time, 730. And that link to register is up on our whenever, wherever Wabash page to go ahead and register now if you're interested. But otherwise, thank you again, Nolan. Thank you all for joining us and have a happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you in Night. January. Take care and Bye. happy Founders Day. <laughs>